It's been over 30 days since I ditched my iPhone 15 Pro and started daily driving the S24 Ultra. This has been a great phone and today I'll be going over what the experience has been like and some of my favorite settings to enable that have made the transition from iOS super smooth. So the model I went with is the titanium black finish with 512GB of storage. I love the sleek look that this phone has and it really goes along well with my all black everyday carry. I have been using it without a case simply because I haven't found one that I like the look of. Aside from it being a little slippery, I I think it works well as a caseless device. The sharper corners have been a non-issue, and the smooth back casing feels great in the hand. This is a much larger phone that I'm used to with a 6.8 inch display, but now that I'm used to it, I love this size. Having the punch hole camera cutout saves a lot of that screen real estate that is especially useful when full screening videos. One-handed use is still a little bit tricky in my opinion, as my thumb doesn't reach the top without adjusting my hand position, though enabling the one-handed mode by swiping down on the screen does make getting at the corners much easier. So switching to Android was actually something that I was looking forward to, as for the last few years, I've wanted to try it out. I at times miss things like AirDrop for sending files to my MacBook, or more seamlessly connecting to my AirPods, but otherwise I've loved daily driving it. If you're switching over from an iPhone, you can create an iCloud backup on it, and then download Smart Switch on your S24, where you'll log into your account and go through the transfer. There are some macOS apps I've been using recently, like Ami and Arc, that don't have an Android version, which is another downside I've experienced from the Switch. Other than those two, too, because I really like them, I have begun switching over almost all of my apps to being cross-platform, this just makes it possible that whatever device I'm on, I still have access to all of my data. Luckily, my calendar syncs up with Google Calendar, which I've had for years, and I've been using Google Tasks and Spark for reminders and email. While there is a huge benefit in having those cross-platform apps, the user experience of the native OS is what's more important. One UI 6, in my opinion, looks really clean. I love the minimal style that I've been able to create with it. There's a lot of customizations that you can make with Android itself, which is something I've really appreciated. If there's ever a setting or a quirk with the OS, that I don't like, 80% of the time the fix is a Google search away. I do find the settings to be a little harder to navigate just because there is so many submenus to get lost in, but the global search functionality has been a lot more useful than an iOS, so it makes up for it. One of the first changes I made was with Chester Navigation, as a lot of you guys recommended it. This is far more convenient than the three buttons at bottom and works very similar, but often better than how iOS does it. If you want to have a smoother experience, you can enable developer mode by tapping on your build number seven times and then head into developer options. I recommend you play around with the three animation scale options to see which feels best for you. You can completely turn them off to instantly activate gestures or go with 0.5x, which is a solid middle ground. With these controls turned on, you have a universal back option by swiping left or right on the screen, which is really nice to have coming from iOS where it will change app to app, whether there's an arrow, an X, or a swipe. The only downside is that in Chrome, there's no way to go forward with a gesture. The only way I found is to press the three dots and then forward. Now, if you download Goodlock and then Navstar, you can customize these gestures even further if you want to. This gives you ability to adjust the sensitivity, transparency, and a lot more. One of the most recent changes I made was to the keyboard. I was having a lot of typos with the stock Samsung one, and after watching Andres' tip video, decided to give Gboard a shot. This definitely has a more similar feel to the iPhone keyboard and has a nice feature hold for symbol. Another change I recommend making is changing your notification pop-up style to brief instead of detailed. This not only takes up less space, but gives a similar look to the dynamic island, which I personally like. You can also change the color effect that happens on screen when you get a notification. Putting on notification history lets you see which apps are sending you the most and get rid of them. When setting alarms, you have the option for it to be read aloud to you, and without fail, this has scared the living shit out of me every morning. Get the now, the S Pen is probably the thing I've used least with this phone, but it's came in really clutch in those couple of times where I wanted to draw out something quick and remembered I had it. If you are worried about losing it, you can go into settings and then the more S Pen settings tab to play a sound anytime you get too far away. The underscreen fingerprint reader for me has been a little finicky. I find that quite a lot I have to retry my fingerprint multiple times to properly unlock my phone. This can get annoying at the gym if I keep doing this between sets, which is why I actually enabled it to be a trusted environment, meaning that when I'm there, my phone stays unlocked. It's the same if I have my AirPods connected, and this just makes things easier. Of course, you open up some privacy issues here, so only do it if you're in a safe place. Now, on this phone, there is a 200 megapixel wide lens, 12 megapixel ultra wide lens, 50 megapixel telephoto with a 5x optical zoom, and then a 10 megapixel telephoto with a 3x optical zoom. I haven't taken this phone out to shoot all that much, but these are the settings that I found best to use. The first thing you may want to enable is the grid, as it just makes composing shots a little easier. 
easier. Another useful feature is setting swipe shutter button to take a burst. In terms of quality, the main rear lens at 200 megapixels is going to be the best. The downside is these photos will take up quite a bit of space, so if you don't want to eat up all of your storage, head into the camera settings and advanced picture options, then enable high efficiency pictures. This will greatly reduce the file size, just keep in mind that some websites and apps aren't going to support it. When you're taking photos, you may or may not want Samsung to be applying their post-processing, so you can cycle between different optimization settings that will control how much this happens. I'd say most of the time the processing is actually quite good, but if you want the best picture out of this camera, going into expert raw and editing within Lightroom is your best bet. If you tend to use the same camera settings all the time, definitely head into settings to keep and enable camera mode as well as high picture resolution. This way, if you always shoot at say 200 megapixels, you don't need to swap over to it every time. You can unlock even more customizations by downloading camera assistant, and this unlocks a new tab within the settings. The option I like most is zoom shortcuts. By default, 100x won't be shown, so you can enable that on. Just note this is an optical zoom on the 5x telephoto. There's also two settings that I think are worth playing around with depending on how you use your camera. The first is quick tap shutter, which will make taking a single photo a little faster, and then prioritize focus over speed, which waits for the camera to focus before taking a photo. I won't go into video just because I haven't really used it at all, but the stabilization has really impressed me. Now, battery life is going to be important, and for me, it's performed incredibly well. That said, I don't really use my phone all that much throughout the day. It's really just used to listen to Spotify and YouTube Premium. Most days, I start at 100%, and then by the time I go to bed, I'm sitting somewhere around 50 to 60%. I charge wirelessly every night, so made sure that I enabled fast wireless charging. The phone also has reverse wireless charging, when in a pinch, like if I forgot to charge my AirPods, is really nice to have. I highly recommend you take a look at the battery saving features. There's going to be three different modes that, depending on how long you plan to use your phone, are best. Samsung has promised over seven years of software updates, and so if you plan to use it for that entire period, I recommend using the maximum mode, which only lets your phone charge to 80%. Of course, this is only going to be an option if you don't drain your phone every day. In that case, the adaptive is probably the best and is the one I have turned on. This uses the maximum mode while you're asleep and then changes to basic just in time for you to wake up. What it does is charge to 100% and then stop until it goes back to 95. Just note that if you fall asleep at varying times each night, this may not work as well. In terms of the AI features introduced with this phone, I haven't made too much use of them day to day, but I still think that they could be useful. Circle to search is really convenient to have. It isn't perfect at recognizing faces or like the exact brand of a product, but it does a pretty good job at telling you what a specific car may be. I use Notion, so haven't been able to take advantage of note summarizing, but from the testing I've done in the notes app, as well as the voice recorder, it does quite a good job. So look, after checking this phone out for the last 30 days, I can definitely say I am happy that I made the switch. My SIM will be staying in here for the time being, and besides some apps not being compatible, in the lack of FaceTime or iMessage, I really like Android. I am looking forward to RCS, I think that's going to make the texting experience a lot better, but stay tuned for my longer term review. I'll eventually do an updated EDC video with this phone, but for now, go watch the one I made a couple months back. Take care.